Hi, I'm Scott. Welcome back to my series, The Decades of Action Challenge, which is inspired by a couple other YouTubers named Razor Wire and Forkball. Their series, uh, The Epic Film Challenge, is them going through this book called 1001 Movies You Must See Before You Die, watching them uh, in no particular order, and then uh, uh, making videos about them. I am uh, patterning my uh, series on a, ser uh, a series of essays uh, by uh, Tom Brehan of avclub.com called A History of Violence, in which he uh, selects one movie uh, starting in 1968 to be the most influential, important action movie of each year, going all the way towards the present. And I'm to 1979 at the moment, and that is uh, The Warriors, directed by Walter Hill. Uh, this is Brehan's pick for the most important action movie of 1979. As he states in his opening paragraph, the um, street punk, the wild, crazy, long-haired street punk was a staple of action cinema up to this point as the villain. Uh, he cites um, other um, movies from his list, such as Dirty Harry and Death Wish and Assault on Precinct 13 as movies that um, had the um, bad guys, basically more or less anonymous bad guys for the most part, be uh, street punks. Whereas the Warriors made the street punks not only the heroes and villains, but basically the entire world. Most of the characters in the movie uh, that have speaking parts are in one gang or another. Um, and the movie doesn't present this as, as uh, in particular, good or bad. It's just sort of a fact of life. It, it takes place within that world, which is highly stylized, to be sure. Um, the gangs in this movie all have their own costumes. Uh, they have their particular outfits that they wear um, to identify themselves. In the case of the Warriors, the main characters belong to a gang called the Warriors who operate out of Coney Island, and their outfit is basically just a vest which says Warriors on the back of it. Um, some of the other costumes are much more elaborate. Uh, there are guys wearing face paint and uh, uh, top hats. Uh, there are guys who are dressed up in pinstripe uh, baseball uh, jerseys along with makeup that looks like they belong in the band Kiss. Um, <clears throat> there's skinheads, there's guys this and that and the other thing. Um, there's, there's plenty of uh, uh, um, distinctive outfits uh, which makes it uh, a little bit cartoonish. And that isn't probably helped by the fact that I watched the director's cut of this movie, which has comic book-like transition between scenes that apparently were not in the original film. As I said last week, I've actually seen this movie one time before, um, but it was a long time ago. Um, when I took a uh, film uh, studies class in high school, um, the teacher devoted um, several weeks to Walter Hill films, uh, watching movies like Band of the Hand and Extreme Prejudice and 48 Hours. Uh, and other uh, Walter Hill films, basically. This was one of them. And when I saw it at the time, I really didn't like it, mostly because it was just scrappy, low-budget, uh, looked pretty shoddy for the most part. Um, wasn't a fan. And I enjoyed it more this time, but I also um, find it difficult to take seriously. Um, one of the issues that I had with um, Spike Lee's uh, film from a couple years ago called Chirac, it came out here um, about a year and a half ago, um, was that there's plenty of gangs in this movie, but no drug dealing, really. Uh, characters smoke grass, uh, and they drink, but there's no crack or meth or any kind of sort of uh, uh, drug dealing business going on, which, as I understand it, is what sort of gangs are, are built on. Um, that's how they make their money, by dealing, uh, dealing uh, 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 drugs. Some, uh, uh, some of them probably deal with guns. Um, but it raises the question of why do the gangs exist if there's no drug dealing going on, if there's no drug market territory to fight over. Uh, they're just protecting their own turf for some reason, um, and they like wearing color-coded outfits. Uh, <laughs> I don't really get it. Um, so it's it's sort of a, a you know a, a cleaner uh, version of uh, gang life um, without any of the uh, guys uh, dealing heroin or crack or anything like that. Um, Anyway, um, the main character uh, of this, like, like I said, the main characters are uh, in this group called the Warriors. Um, at the beginning of the movie, um, there's this uh, character named Cyrus who is part of a gang uh, called the Gramercy Riffs. And he basically sends out word that all the gangs in New York City, all the most prominent gangs in New York City, are going to send nine representatives to this particular park in New York City where they have a big powwow. And the rules are nobody brings any weapons, no knives, guns, nothing. They're all going to gather together, and they're going to have a big powwow and talk. And Cyrus, what he wants to do is unite the gangs, basically, as one big common force, so that they outnumber the cops. So they have control over the streets of New York rather than police. 
um, and he is shot for his trouble. <laughs> he gathers everyone together uh, in an attempt to unite everyone, and a punk from another gang called the Rogues, uh, who uh, violated the rules and brought a pistol, uh, shoots him dead. And then these guys and the Rogues, they blame the Warriors, and they say, hey, we saw the Warriors, they're the ones that shot him. And, and at that point, <laughs> the, uh, the Rifts basically send out word to all the other gangs in the city, the Warriors are dead meat, they shot our leader, find them and, and make them pay, you know. So the Warriors are in deep, deep trouble. They're from Coney Island, and if you're familiar with the ge geography of New York City, Coney Island is one of the extreme far reaches of New York City. <laughs> so to take, you know, it's a long trip to get back there. They figure they can just hop on the train and ride all the way back there, but they encounter a lot of problems uh, along the way. You know, gangs uh, are trying to intercept them left and right. Uh, so they have to sort of fight their way back home. They have to sneak around under the cover of darkness in the middle of night, navigate all these neighborhoods who, who's, who, who, that are already being controlled by other gangs they don't belong to. Um, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a tough go of it. They end up splitting up and, and you know, getting involved with other little sort of B stories and other uh, uh, secondary characters and then converging again uh, to make their way. They lose a couple of members along the way. They start out uh, as nine people and they end up uh, with less than that by the end of the movie. <clears throat> um, but uh, yeah, it's all sort of like a, a get home and get safe before, before it's too late. Of course, you know, if people knew who the Warriors are, they probably know where they're from and they could just... Um, you know, find them there, which is uh, also something that uh, they have to worry about. Um, so yeah, I, I enjoyed this movie more uh, this time than I did last. Of course, it was, you know, well over, like, when did I take this film class? Probably when I was like a sophomore or junior, I think. So that would make it well over 25 years ago. Um, well over 25. Um, yeah, and I didn't remember a whole heck of a lot about it. That I just, you know, didn't didn't care for it all that much. I enjoyed it more this time, but uh, though I still have a couple problems with it. The beginning of the movie basically has the title sequence intercut with a number of two shots of characters who are in the Warriors gang talking amongst each other about this meeting that they're about to go to. Um, and they're discussing what the rules are and, you know, the dangers and everything like that. And this really just feels like a sequence that was shot kind of as an afterthought, just to sort of help set up things. Because, like I said, there's just basically a series of, of two shots of the characters talking amongst each other without really looking at the background. You don't know where they are. You don't know what they're doing uh, at that time. They're just talking and setting up the plot of the movie, and that feels a little uh, stilted and awkward. Um... And uh, <laughs> so uh, let me go through the um, uh, cast a little bit right here. Um, the main character, the um, guy who basically takes control of their group, uh, his name is Swan. He's played by an actor named Michael Beck who appeared in Xanadu and a Wes Craven TV movie called Chiller, which I managed to see just sort of accidentally a bunch of years ago. Um, he is the main character in that. Um, the, uh, their leader um, was uh, a guy named Cleon, who is played by Dorsey Wright. He was in the uh, uh, musical Hair, um, the film. Um, I had don't recognize a lot of the other titles that he's been in. Some of these um, actors really didn't, uh, their careers didn't really go anywhere, but a few of them did. Um, in particular, you've got James Remar, who's another member of the Warriors named Ajax. He's had a really, really long career. He's worked steadily ever since this movie. He's in a Walter Hill movie. is like a 48 Hours in Band of the Hand. He's in Drugstore Cowboy, White Fang, Boys on the Side, Judge Dredd, What Lies Beneath, the Zemeckis movie. He's totally unrecognizable now. He's got a full beard and glasses. He plays a college professor, I think. Um, he's in Too Fast, Too Furious, he's in the third Blade movie, Pineapple Express, X-Men First Class, and Django Unchained. That's, that's quite a career. And those are just the, um, just the, uh, the highlights, the most prominent movies. There's also been a bunch of other feature films and television, uh, aside from that. Um, uh, the other most recognizable face in the cast is, uh, the member of the Rogues who kills Cyrus at the beginning of the movie. His name is Luther, and he's played by David Patrick Kelly. And if you know anything about uh, the set pieces in The Warriors, you might remember the fact that he is the guy uh, who puts the um, beer bottles on his fingers and clinks them together as he taunts the Warriors at the end of the movie. Here. Um, he says, uh, when, when one of the guys, I think it's Swan, asks him, why did you do it? Why did you shoot Cyrus? He's just like, no reason. I just like doing things like that. He's uh, definitely uh, a psycho. And of course, he's well known for not only appearing in this movie, but also Commando with Arnold Schwarzenegger. He is the guy who um, Schwarzenegger thinks is so funny he's going to wait till the last bad guy <laughs> to kill him <laughs> because he likes him. Um, uh, 
and uh, he's also in a movie called Dreamscape uh, with Dennis Quaid in the 80s, uh, a movie that I, I was quite fond of when I saw it. Um, he's also sort of a villainous character in that movie. Um, he's got a great line about a basket. Um, if you haven't seen that movie, you should check it out. It's, it's, it's quite a lot of fun. Um, who else is in this movie? Um, Cyrus, um, the uh, leader of the Gramercy Riffs, he gets killed. He's play, played by a guy named Roger Hill. Um, we have um, also small appearances by Mercedes Rule. Mercedes Rule uh, plays an um, undercover cop in the movie. And when I saw her, I thought she looked familiar. Um, but this was uh, well before I'd seen her in movies like The Fisher King and Last Action Hero. Uh, she was in a lot of movies in the 90s. Um, and uh, yeah, so she's in this one and all. Just, just one scene. Um, there's also a DJ. This is one of the things that I didn't really like about the movie. Um, when I first saw it, is that the DJ, who's uh, played by an actress late, named uh, uh, Lynn Thigpen, she's gone on to be in a bunch of things uh, over the years. Um, all you basically see is her mouth, basically, as she's talking uh, in between songs. But she is sort of like the de facto, um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? Um, dispatcher. <laughs> she's a de facto dispatcher for the gangs and telling them, where the warriors are and sort of keeping everyone uh, updated on, you know, who the latest gang is to attack the warriors and how that battle went. Um, and she also plays songs. Um, she says in the beginning, warriors, this song goes out to you after she learns that they got, uh, that they've been uh, implicated in the death of Cyrus. She plays Nowhere to Run. <laughs> uh, very, very obvious choice. And at the end of the movie, she plays um, the Eagles, which is a really strange choice uh, to play. I'm not really sure why she played the Eagle song. Um, just doesn't seem like, uh, anyway. Um, so, uh, so aside from then, um, probably the most prominent character is a girl named Mercy, uh, who is associated with a gang called the Orphans. Uh, the warriors try to, uh, make their way through, um, a neighborhood that they don't know, that they're not part of. And the Orphans are a gang that they, that weren't uh, invited to the big event, um, and uh, they ask for permission to uh, walk through undisturbed, and the or orphans are like, yeah, yeah, okay, just go on through. But then this girl, Mercy, who knows them, uh, begins taunting them, and begins taunting the orphans uh, for not giving them uh, a hard time about walking through the territory, and so that leads to a conflict that the warriors come out on top of, and so when um, Mercy sees this, she's kind of like, I I'd rather be associated with the warriors than the orphans. I think the warriors uh, are, are much, have their act together. Um, so she ends up um, following them around, basically, and they're like, what are you doing? Get out of here, you know, and she's just like, no, nah, no, nah, you guys are all right. I want to I wanna stick with you guys. In particular, Swan, the chief, the uh, war chief, as they call him, um, you know, she wants to attach uh, herself to him uh, <laughs> in more than one way uh, because she feels like, you know, being associated with these guys is uh, better for her in general. Um, Mercy's played by Deborah Van Valkenburg, who I'm not really familiar with, although um, on her, uh, on her uh, resume she's got Streets of Fire and The Devil's Rejects, Rob Zombie movie. Uh, she's quite a looker, quite a stunner. Um, <laughs> so I was pleased every time she came on camera. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, an unrealistic movie, um, but overall pretty fun. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, not probably one of my favorite movies. Again, it's just like, uh, oh, I should talk about a little bit about the uh, set pieces. There's three big set pieces in the movie, aside from just the, uh, you know, scenes where they're running around being chased by guys. Well, the cops find them at one point, a couple of gangs find them at one point, but the big set pieces are in the beginning when Cyrus gets killed, um... Uh, then there's just chaos and all the gangs like you know storm out of the uh, out of the park as quickly as possible because the cops are converging. Um, so that's a pretty big scene. Um, you've got the fight between um, the warriors and the baseball furies, uh, the guys in the uh, pinstripe uh, baseball uniforms wielding bats. Um, uh, that's a that's a good fight scene, but the problem is the lighting. It takes place in a park in the middle of night, and yet everything is really brightly lit, so you can see it easily. It's a little issue there. Um, the best scene probably is the one that takes place in the um, men's room of a train station, and this is a scene that I really didn't like because none of the shots were framed really carefully the way I liked it. But it's you know it's got it's really really high energy, uh, and it's a good you know another gang finds them basically in the train station, so the warriors all duck into the men's room, and when the other gang comes in, there's a big fight that breaks out. Uh, really quickly cut, really chaotic. Um, 
good scene. I like that scene. That'll be uh, a candidate for uh, best action sequence, I think, at the uh, 1980 MTV Movie Awards, if they existed back then. <clears throat> um, so yeah, um, overall, decent movie. Um, fun. Um, it's okay. You know, not, uh, not great or anything. It's okay. Um, I'm glad I got a chance to see it again, because, like I said, when I saw it um, years and years and years ago, I didn't like it that much, so uh, I uh, sort of appreciate it a little bit better now. Although I do find it kind of unrealistic, the fact that, you know, there's no drug activity, really. <laughs> it's like, you know, why are they dressing up in these costumes and forming gangs if they're not fighting over uh, uh, d drug distribution territory? No reason. They just like doing things like that, right? Just like David Patrick Kelly said. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you very much for watching. If you'd like to look at more videos in my series, the link to the playlist is below, the link to my Facebook page is below, and also, of course, the link to Tom Brehan's article on the Warriors on avclub.com. Uh, also, you'll find that below as well. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you again next week with the next movie. What is it again? Ah, yes, Chuck Norris once again appears on this list. He's in a movie called The Octagon, a movie that I've never seen before. Don't expect it to be great, but it's Tom Brehan's pick, so I'm checking it out next week. See you then. Bye.